So first thing I want to ask you about is this uh, congressional push to suspend energy imports from Russia. Um, you know, how does this differ from the executive action the president took? Why is this a necessary step and what exactly would it do? Yeah, so what we're talking about here is HR 6968. Um, it's the Suspending Energy Imports from Russia Act. Uh, you know, this bill would, and this has been a negotiation for a couple of days, and it's been a bit of a back and forth with the White House. Obviously, the president made his announcement, um, but you know, there's additional legislative steps that are required uh, to shut off and make illegal any energy imports from Russia to the United States. Uh, you know, there's some uh, flexibility here. There's a 45 day period because if something is loaded onto a ship tomorrow uh, and the bill passes and it's already in route, it's already been paid for, you know, so there's about a 45 day grace period there, but the goal is so that additional dollars are not flowing to Vladimir Putin uh, and oftentimes to the tunes of, of tens of millions a day, but those dollars are not flowing to him uh, to better allow him to continue to attack the, the Ukrainian people. And, and again, when it comes to sanctions, there are things that the executive can do uh, by themselves, just with the authorities that a president already has. And then there are other components that require a legislative backstop. Um, you know, where that line is on any given area can sometimes be a little bit gray. So we want to make sure that we are not only bolstering what the president is doing, but also creating a firm uh, measure of congressional support, but also more importantly, uh, making it harder for the president to change their mind uh, as things go. That if there is going to be a modification of something, Congress has passed it, it's written into law, and then we have the ability to, to waive or to uh, reevaluate as things continue. And then I want to talk about, you know, some of the steps the U.S. has taken already, whether that's the economic sanctions and then now obviously this push to, you know, stop importing um, oil from Russia. You know, what else can be done and what else should be done, do you think? Yeah, one thing that I was frankly frustrated got removed from the sanctions bill that uh, I expect we'll contemplate today. Uh, it's a little bit uh, of a back and forth right now. We're waiting to see what legislation uh, the Democratic majority puts forward. But at least from my understanding is that uh, the White House insisted and, and the Democrats complied with stripping provisions that would have removed the most favored nation status from both Belarus and Russia. Uh, and this is a some flexibility and some beneficial treatment on the trade side that the Ukrainians had asked us to strip from Belarus and Russia and that we had uh, put into that initial legislation and that was removed on the White House side. So that's another thing we need to do on the most favored nation side. Uh, we also need to continue and step up our efforts to seize uh, or at least investigate and where possible seize the assets of the Russian oligarchs, those who have profited from the Putin regime, those who are continuing to support and enable the violence that Vladimir Putin is unleashing on Ukraine. Uh, so we've been working with the Biden administration to expand some of those areas uh, when it comes to the Russian Duma, that's their legislature. Uh, we led an effort to get that expanded, not just to folks who originally authorized the independence independence recognition for uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, those areas of Donbass that precipitated this, uh, but to apply that to the entirety of the Russian legislature. And then also focusing on um, going beyond the yachts, which uh, we obviously want to, uh, to seize their yachts, uh, but also when it comes to luxury penthouses that may be in the US or maybe in other jurisdictions, uh, making it so that those who are continuing to assault and attack the international system do not benefit from the privileges of it. Talk to me about what, you know, how the US has the authority to do that. Say, you know, one of these oligarchs has a, a you know, 100 foot yacht park somewhere. How do we have the ability to seize that? And then talk to me about the, you know, Bill, uh, you want to see done where you could actually use that money to give back to Ukraine. Yeah, that's one area that we're working with the administration on, because again, it can be a fine line between what requires a legislative initiative and what the president can do uh, on the president's own authority. Uh, but I think it's important that those seized assets uh, get set aside and are used to help rebuild Ukraine. I think we've all seen that incredible devastation. Um, uh, just the hospital bombing in Mariupol, uh, a city that I visited seven years ago um, when it was still close to the front lines. And now it's obviously a city under siege. You know, I think it's important that those seized assets go to the people of Ukraine to help correct this grievous and violent error. Um, the there can be there were, some of those authorities exist under what's called the Magnitsky Act. This was an act that was passed, um, I believe, in 2014 
Uh, Sergei Magnitsky was a Russian lawyer uh, who had defended uh, a, an American businessman named Bill Browder, uh, and that uh, Magnitsky ended up being arrested by the Russians, um, beaten, and, and ultimately died in jail from uh, from wounds that were sustained. And so, as a result, there was a legislative initiative in the United States Congress so that those who were perpetrating such you know, egregious violations of human rights that they could have their you know, assets taken as a, an incentive for folks to obey the rule of law um, and, and not commit such heinous crimes. So there's been efforts to expand that Magnitsky Act so that we can use those authorities. Uh, but the president also has pretty wide latitude, especially when it comes to a non-US citizen or a non-US person uh, and those assets, especially if they've been connected into you know, a, a criminal network or other components. So you know, that question of those authorities is something we're, we're continuing to look at and support. In addition, um, some of the properties that were purchased by the oligarchs in the US are under shell companies that may have multiple layers of insulation. So proving and identifying the beneficial ownership there will take some time. Uh, but that's another step that we need to take. Uh, we've seen a very swift implementation of a large number of sanctions. Um, and I think that has been a, a resoundingly positive effort. Uh, and, and frankly, probably not what Putin was expecting in terms of unity from the European Union and from NATO. Uh, and also uh, from the US kind of leading a little bit from behind on some of those, but but still kind of bringing a lot of those sanctions to the table. Now, as we're looking at the last five or 10% of what we can do, um, it's a little bit harder. It's a little bit slower going. It's a, a little bit more unprecedented, uh, but making sure that that economic isolation uh, is as complete as possible so that Putin learns the lesson here and that hopefully uh, we get to a point where those forces back down, uh, that they, they retreat from Ukraine, and then most importantly, we're able to continue to provide and rebuild the Ukrainian state that Vladimir Putin has decimated. Um, and, you know, uh, underlying thing of all this is obviously energy, and we've seen Republicans, you know, call for um, America to strive for energy independence again and start producing more um, here at home. You know, where do you where do you stand on that? Do you think that's an important step? And I want to get your take on, you know, we saw some of the, the Biden administration visiting places like Venezuela and, and look for other outlets besides um, here. Yeah, I, I've been pretty unsparing in my criticism. Um, you know, I think the Biden administration is looking for a, an easy way out here that doesn't force them to reevaluate many of their, in my view, misguided domestic policies. Uh, that's why you've seen them approaching the Venezuelans, why they've been approaching uh, the Iranians and trying to use the new uh, nuclear negotiations that I also think are very misguided as a way of uncorking some additional uh, oil supplies and natural gas supplies on the global market. Um, the simple answer here is that the Biden administration needs to reverse course on their hostility towards American energy production. Like we've seen very clearly that achieving energy independence is a national security issue. Some of our, our NATO allies like Germany that had hitched their star to natural gas coming from Russia. Uh, you know, we, I'm sure many folks are familiar with Nord Stream 2, but there was a Nord Stream 1 that's supplying, I think, 30% of Germany's natural gas coming from Russia that they have control over. So giving that sort of leverage to a foreign power is very challenging. Uh, you know, and when I talk about where reversing course, ceasing the inherent hostility, uh, the slow rolling of permitting, uh, the, the difficulties and the roadblocks being thrown in the face of American energy producers. I, I am a strong proponent of expanding renewable energy, but we have to be clear and honest with the American people that we will need on-demand energy generation. Uh, we can maximize the utilization of solar, of wind, of other renewables, uh, we will need something when the sun isn't shining and wind is blowing. Nuclear is a great, you know, low to no carbon option there, as is you know, a slightly higher carbon output, but natural gas and the expansion of natural gas and the retirement of coal plants is why we saw a net reduction in carbon output in the U.S. Uh, in the mid-2010s. So that is a tremendous opportunity to be producing at home, to be employing Americans, uh, to be ensuring that those profits, those proceeds, they stay in the U.S. are reinvested and the Biden administration needs to signal a greater openness and a, frankly, an end to this war on domestic energy production they've been waging through the courts and through an overly burdensome regulatory environment. And I know we're still uh, kind of waiting here to see what, what's going to be included in this spending bill exactly. All this is going on. I do want to ask you, though, I know the uh, administration is calling for funding for um, Ukraine and helping Ukraine out. Do you think that should be included in there? And, and what should that money help do? 
I do. I mean, obviously, we have been uh, both supplying weaponry uh, that we have. So some of those stocks need to be replenished so that we can make sure we're ready in the event of a conflict. We've also been encouraging many of our allies uh, to give uh, weapons to Ukraine and to transfer that. So making sure we're in a good position to assist uh, and, and also dealing with the incredible number of refugees from Ukraine that are in uh, especially in Poland, but in other parts of Eastern and Central Europe right now. I think we're close to 2 million people. So that's 5% of the Ukrainian population that has currently left the country. And that number is sure to grow. Uh, so I think it's important that we are ready to rapidly provide aid so we can build back the degree of stability uh, and, and safety and security for the Ukrainian people. Um, you know, that investment now, but not only is it the moral thing to do, and, and will end and, and have a direct humanitarian impact in the short term, uh, but will also make it a lot easier for us to, to do that rebuilding and make the things to continue to go downhill. So I think that's an important investment that we should be making right now for the stability and prosperity of Europe.